While the focus of Cubs fans has been on the Major League team lately, a lot is brewing in the minors as well. According to Fangraphs, the Cubs have the second most viable farm system in baseball, and in the new MLB Pipeline update, the Cubs have five top 100 prospects, with only Baltimore and Pittsburgh having more. It's an impressive farm considering the success of the Major League team right now, and while I think most people would consider it a top 10 farm system rather than a top 2 farm like Fangraph says, it is certainly great to see a ranking be so high on it. So today I'm going to take you guys through the prospects who I think are the top 12 most untouchable guys in the Cubs minors, focusing on the players with the highest ceilings. Now this is highly subjective, but basically these are 12 players who I feel the most need to highlight based on their potential, and you viewers can feel free to shout out the prospects who I don't cover in the comments below. There's bound to be quite a few as there's definitely more than 12 good prospects in this farm system. I don't want this to just be reading off the Cubs top 12 prospects, and I do want to cover guys that I haven't talked about before, but also people watching this may not have seen the past videos or know much of anything about the farm right now, so I will cover players that have appeared in multiple videos in the past. Also, just a note, I don't consider any prospects truly 100% untouchable in trades. Everyone can go for the right price, especially now that we're a buying team, but these are the guys I'd least like to see go. Starting at the lower levels of the minors, our first guy is Jefferson Rojas. Rojas is the number 11 ranked prospect in the farm on MLB Pipeline, ahead of guys who are pretty established high minors prospects like Matt Mervis, Alexander Canario, and Daniel Palencia despite his inexperience. The Cubs signed Rojas for a million dollars out of the Dominican Republic in 2022, and now this year as an 18 year old he's playing for the Myrtle Beach Pelicans in low A, and for his age is doing really well. Against pretty much exclusively older pitchers, Rojas on the year has hit 261 with a 345 on base, 4 home runs and 11 doubles in 48 low A games. He puts the bat on the ball really easily with a fast and very controlled swing, and has definite flashes of power that showed only increase in frequency as he gets older and larger. His speed is around average, he'll never be much of a threat on the base paths, and as a fielder, besides a strong arm, from what I've read, uh, he hasn't shown much to suggest he'll stick at shortstop, but being a player that's so young, he has lots of time to work on any flaws. Rojas just turned 18 in April, so for him to be an above average low A hitter is a very, very good thing. 19 year old lefty starting pitcher Jackson Ferris is another really young prospect who's getting results in Myrtle Beach. As a second round pick out of high school, Ferris went straight to low A for his pro debut this year, where he's made 14 starts and has a 3.46 ERA in 39 innings. While his command is still very raw and he's walking almost 6 batters per 9, he's also striking out 12.5 and, and he's held opponents to just a 176 batting average. Scouts think his command could be average by the time he develops, and as a 6'4 lefty with a unique delivery that features a very vertical arm slot, Ferris has lots of depth on his breaking pitches that help him miss bats along with a low to mid 90s fastball. While his command issues could one day limit him to the bullpen, Ferris has a high ceiling as a starting pitcher and like Rojas, is already very good for his level and has tons of time to improve. Moises Ballesteros carries on the theme of players below 20 putting up good numbers, but he's doing that at a level above that of Ferris and Rojas. While those guys are certainly holding their own in low A, 19 year old catcher Moises Ballesteros is excelling in high A. Ballesteros as a hitter, at least for now, is without flaws. Between low A Myrtle Beach and high A South Bend, he's hit 286 with a 390 on base, 10 home runs, 24 doubles, and 57 walks to 59 strikeouts in 91 games. While, as you'd expect, his power and his discipline haven't looked quite as good in South Bend as they did in Myrtle Beach, his average has surged to 304, and he's continued to show an excellent feel for hitting to the opposite field. Judging off both skill set and body type, an obvious comparison for Ballesteros is Alejandro Kirk, who is a legitimate starting catcher. Defensively, Ballesteros does leave a lot to be desired in terms of doing things that require mobility, like blocking and getting up quick to throw out runners, but like I keep saying, there's lots of time to figure it out, and his ability to hit does make up for a lot, even if he turns out to not be a full-time catcher. He's also 7 for 7 in stolen bases, not that he'll ever be some speed threat, but I just thought that was kind of funny. Matt Shaw was the Cubs' first round pick and the 13th overall pick in this year's draft. Coming out of the University of Maryland, he played three rookie league games, hit 500, and has since played seven games in high A, where he's hit 378 with a double, two triples, and a home run. He's able to swing really, really hard without sacrificing contact, and that results in him crushing a lot of baseballs to all fields. He's overall just a complete hitter. In college, there wasn't a type of pitch he struggled with more than others, and he was equally good against righties and lefties. At age 21, Shaw is making it seem like he could probably be in double A right now, which is great, and from there, if he performs, he could have a quick path to the majors. Now, I don't know where he'd play. He was a shortstop in Maryland, 
but doesn't have a great arm. Of course, second base is occupied by an eco, so maybe third base will have to be the answer. As Nick Madrigal has shown, you don't need to have the strongest arm to do well at the hot corner. No matter where he plays on the field though, he will provide good contact and power hitting, and could very well be the team's top prospect when PCA graduates. I was gonna have either Michael Arias or James Triantos take up this next spot, but considering Hayden McGeary plays more of a position of need at first base, and hits the ball as hard as anyone, I think he's a little more untouchable than those guys. The Cubs 15th round pick in 2022, McGeary is already 23 years old, but is also performing well in AA, putting up an 870 OPS in 78 games with Tennessee after murdering South Bend the first month of the season. McGeary, along with putting up incredible exit velocities on par with the best power hitters in the game and a hard hit rate around 50%, has shown a great ability to draw walks as well, as he's drawn 65 in just 98 games and has a 418 on base percentage between high A and double A. Defensively, McGeary might not offer you much, he's at first base for a reason, but if he keeps hitting and maybe starts elevating the ball more for more home runs, then he could be a very legitimate candidate for the Cubs' first base spot in the near future. Kevin Alcantara, who was acquired for Anthony Rizzo in the 2021 trade deadline, is a player who shows up in all these videos, I even made one about him specifically, but his ceiling is so high that I just can't leave him out of a video about untouchable prospects. It's kind of been a tale of two seasons for Kevin this year, his first two months were terrible, but then in the past 90 days he's hit 307 with a 377 on base and a 497 slugging in high A. Alcantara is an uber athletic 6'6 outfielder who has above average speed and power for days, 48% of Alcantara's batted balls have been hit 95 miles per hour or harder, and it's showing in his high A stats as he has 20 doubles and 9 home runs in 78 games. Naturally for a guy as tall and long as him, he has swing and miss issues, but as those begin to reflect in his numbers at higher levels in the minors, he should also be getting stronger and hitting more home runs and doubles. It'll be hard to get there, but the ceiling for Alcantara is pretty much an MVP caliber player. A lot has to go right, but he's shown the potential to do pretty much everything a major league superstar does, and he also does it with a lot of style. He's bound to be a fan favorite once he arrives. Though he's just a 21 year old in high A, Alcantara is on the Cubs 40 man roster, which means each year he's in the minors is an option year he burns, and those are of course limited, so the Cubs will have to pick up the pace in which they push him through the minors, maybe expect to see him in AA by season's end and AAA at some point next season. Yet another guy whose greatest asset is a propensity to smoke the ball, 21 year old outfielder Owen Casey has not only been one of the best performers in the Cubs farm, but also in AA as a whole. In 92 games, Casey, who was acquired in the U Darvish trade, has hit 292 with a 395 on base, a 553 slugging, 24 doubles, 21 home runs, and 74 RBI in 94 games. But something to keep in mind is that his strikeout rate is nearly 38%, which is massive and needs to come down if he's going to be successful. However, even if he strikes out at a well above average rate, as long as it's not crazy high like 38%, he crushes the ball enough to make up for it. A good sign is that he doesn't chase a lot, he just whiffs at pitches in the zone, so maybe as he gets more at bats he'll begin making more contact, we can only hope. Defensively, despite a good arm, his speed and overall fielding skills are below average, so he's not going to be the best outfielder and will likely be stuck in left field or at DH, but as long as he's hitting like he is now, that is not going to be an issue. Next up, we have 2021 first round pick Jordan Wicks, a 23 year old lefty starter who across Tennessee and Iowa has a 3.53 ERA over 19 starts. He's quite consistent, he's never perfect, but rarely gets blown up. His last three starts in Iowa have all been five innings, one earned, and he's done a nice job limiting hits. He does, however, give up quite a few home runs and walk guys, although his command is said to be above average. He throws a low to mid 90s fastball, which is a fine pitch. His best pitch, though, is his changeup. He also has a good slider with some sweep to it, as well as a curveball, and newly this year, a cutter. Wicks is not an especially overpowering or nasty pitcher, but people still see him as a very steady back of the rotation starter as soon as 2024, though his ETA on MLB Pipeline is actually this season. With Stroman and Hendricks set to hit free agency and Drew Smiley kind of falling apart, Wicks I think is borderline untouchable as he could be very important towards the success of this team next year. I think the exact same can be said for his Iowa teammate Ben Brown, who the Cubs got for David Robertson. Brown has a lot less command but has better stuff than Wicks. His fastball sits mid to high 90s and probably looks faster given he's 6'6 and releases it closer to the plate than most guys. He also throws a hard curveball that rarely gets hit and then a very hard low 90s slider. After dominating Tennessee, Brown was called up to Iowa and in 15 starts, he's posted a 4.85 ERA while striking out 12.5 per 9, but also walking 5.5. So yeah, Brown's issue has definitely been command, 
and if that persists, he might be more suited to a bullpen role in the future. However, if that does get sorted out, Brown could fill in as a starter next year. He hasn't pitched a whole lot in the minors thanks to injuries, so it is possible that his command will improve as he gains experience. Cade Horton is the Cubs' top pitching prospect and number 30 on MLB Pipeline's top 100. He has mid to top of the rotation potential and is showing it a year after being drafted 7th overall. Across Myrtle Beach, South Bend, and now Tennessee, Horton has a 3.17 ERA in 17 starts with 94 strikeouts in 61.1 innings, as well as a 0.98 whip. His fastball has averaged 95 to 97 miles per hour with movement. He also has a great slider as well as a mid-80s curveball that has been successful this year and a high 80s changeup that is still developing, but has been useful against lefties. Horton turns 22 very soon, and although he doesn't have a super long track record of pitching at a high level, he'd actually never been that good up until about a month before his selection in the draft, he should still see the majors in the next couple of years and is a guy who could be very valuable for this team. Before I get to the last guy, you definitely already know who it is. I'm just going to drop some names as honorable mentions. Michael Arias, James Triantos, Daniel Palencia, Matt Mervis, Alexander Canario. There you go. These guys would have been the next on this list if there weren't players who I thought had either slightly higher upside or play positions of need, which made them more untouchable. I still would rather not trade any of these guys, but there's players in the farm who I think have higher ceilings or that I just honestly wanted to talk about more. Okay, so the last prospect is obviously Pete Crow Armstrong. The guy should probably be a top 10 prospect in all of baseball right now. He's essentially a perfect defensive center fielder and will win gold gloves as long as he plays full seasons. Offensively, this year was going to be a big test for him as he made the jump to double A, and he responded by hitting 289 with an OPS of 898, 14 home runs, 5 triples, 19 doubles, and 27 steals in his 73 games. In his 9 games since being called up to AAA, PCA has remained excellent with an OPS of 895. He's chasing less and hitting the ball harder than he did last year in low and high A, though he does remain vulnerable on high and outside pitches, and in the majors that could limit him offensively. However, even if he's not an all-star caliber hitter, which he still could be, his defense will carry him and always make him valuable to the team. PCA is a guy who I don't think the Cubs would trade for anyone right now who's actually available, and for good reason, as he could be an excellent and exciting player for years to come in the major leagues with an ETA of next season. So there you guys have it. These were the guys who I thought were the 12 most untouchable prospects in the Cubs farm. Please like, please subscribe, comment your thoughts. I'll see you in the next one.